All right. Well, we're going to begin here with the second half of chapter 10. And as I said, we're probably not going to be quite as long uh, on the second half. Uh, and part of the reason for that is our internet was down. So y'all pray we're having some technical issues if uh, something happens and I don't know, it won't affect this, I guess, but if we do lose power or whatever else, we're working on it. So let's jump right in. I know it's been two weeks. Uh, again, we had VBS last week, and so thank you all for praying for VBS. We had, what, 45 kids, I think, uh, and it was, it was pretty amazing. So we were able to plant some good seeds. So in a review, we looked at the first half, the first, really the first four verses of chapter 10. Took all of our session last week. And a kind of a culmination, this is the overview, in the midst of judgment, God's provide, God provides peace for those who are his. Right? He's judging the earth, but for those who are his, they find peace. We see the strong angel, right? This is mighty angel who's standing, a foot in the land, foot in the sea. He reminds us of God's provision and his promises, and he gives us hope to endure to the end. Uh, just one of my little notes right here. Um, this powerful angel conveyed high rank and his authority from God by straddling the land and the sea. His huge size contrasts with the smallness of God's enemies. When things are going bad in your life, remember that this angel represents the kind of power that is on your side. God's angelic forces are with you. Keep your problems in their proper perspective by remembering that God, God's power is available to you to deal with your problems. This is just one angel, he's massive, he spans, you know, he's a giant. And if that's just one of God's legions of angels, how much more, how much more does he can use room for us? So, good reminder for those. We're also reminded there are some things that we just aren't meant to know yet, and that's okay. Remember that the when the angel called out, right, he gave the holy heads up, said his voice roared like a lion, and the thunders broke out. And John was going to write it down, and a voice from heaven said, no, 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 don't, don't write that down. That's not for people to know yet. There's some things that we're just not going to know. And that's okay. And that's all right. We also see that God is still in control, even through tribulations and persecution. God is still in control. So, let's go back. Let's review this angel a little bit more as we look at the angel and the little scroll. Now, the word angel is angloss in the Greek, which literally means a messenger, right? They are the postman of heaven. That is what an angel does. Now, they are much more than that, but that is literally what the word angel means. That's definition. So when you share a message from Scripture with someone, you are acting as an angel, as a messenger. Now, you may not always act like an angel, but you're filling that role as a messenger. When God puts something on your heart, you say, hey, I really need to share this with you. Okay? You are a messenger. You're acting in the role of an angel in that perspective. Now, these angels in this context here are spiritual beings, right? Angelic beings. Now, we don't usually get a lot of descriptions about the angels. We get descriptions of what they're doing or of where they are, but not of them physically, what they look like. So this angel we know to be a very large being. Uh, and he's described as a human with a head, hands, legs, feet, a voice, etc. And these are all characteristics we give to human beings. And we look at someone, you can look at someone and say, hey, that's a human. Okay? Same thing is true with this angel. When John saw this angel, he didn't say it was a being. He said it looked like a dude. Okay? It was very clear. This is what it looked like. Now, this is the first physical description we've had of an angel like this. You think back at all the angels. We're told that they see an angel. An angel appears to them. But we're not really told how they look. Now, I know from pictures you've seen that have come out of the Renaissance, the angels all have blonde hair and blue eyes just like Jesus, right? They're white people from Germany. Uh, they don't look Jewish at all, okay? But really, we have no idea what the angels look like. Are they able to take different forms? Are they able to appear in different ways, shapes? I think so because the Bible said some of us have entertained angels unawares. So I don't know. But in this case, this angel is described as a human in that form. And I think the reason why is it was able for John to relate to this being. It wasn't some huge, terrifying monster. He's already seen those. But here is a human. He can relate. He has that connection. You know, if you, if you were, remember as a kid, you ever got lost? 
and you saw someone familiar, the, the wave of relief that washed over you, John has seen a lot of stuff going on, and now he sees this angel, and it's, okay, it's not scary. It, I mean, it's big, right? But it's, it's, it's something I can relate to. And there's a reason for that. Now, standing with one foot on the land and the other foot on the sea, massive angel, okay? This is not just like you go to the beach and you put one foot here and one foot here. I think the imagery here is of a massive angel. And I think with his foot in the land and the foot in the sea, it represents the universal nature of his message. Right? It's, it's for all people in all places. And I think that's the reason why this angel is described as a human being, right? This is something that we can relate to. It's something we see we can connect with. God is doing this because he wants to connect with as many people as possible. We, we can already look at Scripture and see that mu we're much more wicked than they were 2,000 years ago. As, as Paul said in, in Romans, we have invented ways of doing evil. And yet God has not wiped out the earth. Why? Because God is patient and he wants as many as possible to be saved. It doesn't necessarily fit our timeline, but it's not up to me. It's up to God. It says he has a booming voice, which is like that of a lion, and it inspires the thunders to roar. But we don't know what they said. Okay, so that's kind of our review on the angel there. So let's keep going here with verse 5. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who was sitting on the sea and on the land, or standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now that brings us to the end of chapter 10. Now, just as a reminder, we're still in this interlude between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. Just like there was a break between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, now we have this break between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. Okay, So we're still in that interlude. We're also still in the second woe. Remember, there were three woes pronounced before the blowing of the fifth trumpet. After the fourth trumpet, the eagle was a flying in midair, woe, 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 for the things that are coming from the next three trumpets. Okay. This is still the second woe, but we're in this interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets. Just a little background there. So it says he raised his right hand. Now, what does that usually mean when someone raises their right hand? Right? It means they're, they're taking an oath, right? I remember I, I learned this when I was watching uh, Abbott and Costello. He had his hat on, right? It's, it was like, uh, here, put your hat, uh, take your hat off. Put your hand on the Bible. You know, raise your right hand. Put your left hand on the Bible. No, take your hand. All right, you went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Well, we learned that. Raise your right hand. That means you're taking an oath, and there's a reason for that. It hasn't changed in thousands and thousands of years in human history. That has been a saying. You go all the way back to the Old Testament, and we see that the right hand is the hand of blessing. Why is Jesus seated at the right hand of God? Because this is the hand of blessing. This is the hand that was always ceremonially clean. This is why we offer the right hand of fellowship. The right hand is the hand that we take an oath with, okay? Many of you here today took an oath of office, and you raise your right hand. Same thing is true here. The angel raises his right hand to heaven. He's preparing to take an oath. And what it's saying is that everything that he says after that is trustworthy and true. Now, he's not speaking on his own merit. He's going to swear by heaven. And, and the one who, I should say not by heaven, but he's going to swear by the one who created everything. Okay, I'm speaking the truth on his behalf. Everything that I say, you can write down as fact. This is why when people go to the courthouse, you know, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. Okay, you, you take the oath that everything you're about to say is true. 
lest you perjure yourself and become guilty of a crime. But it signifies that what he is saying is true. Now, this is not the first time that we see this. Actually, back in Daniel chapter 12, wrapping up the end of things, coming to the very end, Daniel has one more vision. He sees two men standing on either side of the bank, and he sees a man in linen above the water. And he asks, when is all this stuff that I've seen, this last vision, when is all this stuff going to come to pass? And it said uh, Daniel 12, 7, The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever. Okay, that was a, a double. Okay, I've got nothing to hide. This is the honest truth. So this idea is not something new of these angelic speakers raising their hand. Again, we've already borrowed very heavily from Daniel, from Exodus, and Ezekiel. John is really laying into these things. Why? Well, because God, who inspired Daniel to write, and the Exodus to be written, and Ezekiel to write, is the same God. He hasn't changed, and his motives have not changed. His methods have not changed. His message has not changed. He's still the same as he was yesterday, today, and forever. He is eternal. And so the reason we see a lot of these same themes repeated is not just like John says, that was a really good idea, I need to write that down. It's because this is what John saw, and John remembers this because God's word is always true. It's not something to be taken lightly here. This is very serious. As I said, if you go to court and you raise your right hand and you take the oath and you lie under oath, you can go to prison, right? That's, that's as bad as committing another crime that you're testifying against. You can go to jail. Why? Because it's still illegal. And I know that our legal system is kind of wonky right now, but there are still things that we look down on. And a man who doesn't have integrity is one of them. If I can't trust you to, under oath, tell the truth, I don't trust you, right? There are, there, there are still things, even in the secular world, that they look down on, and that's one of those things. If I can't trust you to tell the truth, I just can't trust you, period. Why is that important? Well, because that's still biblical moral that comes out of Scripture. And they still want those things. Why? Because it's still the truth. And we respect people who tell the truth. Now, and he swears by him who lives forever and ever. By him who lives forever and ever. He's saying this message is not just from me. This is not just something, hey, I felt like we needed to take an interlude. You know, I remember when I was a kid, it seemed like the, the, the commercials got paid per word. So they'd be in the middle of the program, and you get to the climax, and you're like, wow, and then they break for commercial. And we talk about something completely off the wall. Hi, I'm Bob. I'm here to talk to you today about the importance of using Q-tips, or whatever it is. And it's just like, come on, get back to the program. Okay, that's not what's happening here. He's saying this is very important, and you need to understand, before the next trumpet comes, this is what God is saying. I'm the messenger, and I'm going to tell you so that you know what God is saying to you. Okay, this is very important. He swears by him who lives forever and ever. He speaks of the eternal nature of God surpassing time and space. He says this message is not just for right here. Just in this little moment, once it's done, once we're done with the chapter, you can move on and forget it. He said, no, this is from God. This is a universal message. It's a timeless message from a timeless God. And you need to pay attention. That's the statement of authority. Like when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. What he was saying is, you need to pay attention to what comes next because of the one who is speaking. Okay, Very much. I'm the grown-up here, and you're the kid. You need to listen because you don't have authority. I've had to have that conversation a couple times with my children. I'm sure you have too. You have to establish the authority before what comes next. Someone on the street can say, hey, your head's ugly. Okay, I don't care. Who are you, right? If I don't respect the source, the message doesn't matter. Okay? So, by him who lives forever and ever. It's not just anybody. It's almighty, infinite, eternal God. And he also swears by him who created the earth and all that is in it and the sea that is all that is in it. Now, remember where his feet are. They're on the earth and in the sea. And they're, burn, they're like burning pillars of fire is how John described them. Again, representing God's presence. What is fire used for? Especially in their day and age, it's used for purification. If 
you wanted metal to be nice, you didn't just use whatever metal you found in the ground, you had to put it in the crucible and melt it and you purified it, burn off all the impurities to get good metal. The same is true here. We see these burning pillars. It represents God's presence, God's guidance, and also the purifying nature of God's call upon people. And so when he swears by him who lives forever and ever and who created all that is on the earth and all that is in the sea, this again is a universal message from the creator of the universe. So pay attention because what comes next is very important. And what does come next? There will be no more delay. Now that should either frighten us or be an encouragement. Depends on where we stand. Now, if I know I'm doing something wrong and someone says, Mama's coming home, <laughs> uh, I, I'm in trouble, right? But if I have done what my mother expects and has asked me to do, and I have done it with excellence, I'm not worried my mom comes. I'm excited that mom's coming, right? Because I love my mom. I'm not worried. So when the angel says, there will be no more delay, well, it's either good or bad, depending on which side of the thing you're on. It is an encouraging message for the faithful. Thank heavens, we've been waiting a long time for this. There will be no more delay. And it reminds us of the question that was asked by the martyrs in chapter 6, verse 10. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Right, that's the question that was asked all the way back there in chapter 10. How long? And now the angel's pronouncing there will be no more delay. I think that's pretty good news. Now, does that mean it's going to happen today or tomorrow? I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. Yet being the operative word. And again, God's timing is not our timing. And so we rely and trust in him. It says here, it gives us kind of a landmark, in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. Now, my brain read this, and the first thing I thought was, just how long do these trumpet blasts last? Because <laughs> I read that as in the days when he's blowing his trumpet. I'm like, how many days has this guy blowing his trumpet? I mean, I know how hard it is to blow a trumpet. At my peak, I could hold a note for two and a half minutes, roughly. I'm like, this guy's blowing his trumpet for days? That's incredible. And then I went back and read it again. And I say that to say, read your Bibles carefully. Don't just skim through it. Make sure you understand what you read and that you read it correctly. Many a false theology has come out of good intentions and poor reading. He's talking about the days leading up to the trumpet blast, not the blast itself. So where is he now? He is in the days, as he's speaking, he is in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet. It's coming up. It, it's right there at the door. You've heard the phrase, it's about to blow. Okay? There's an anticipation and an excitement. If you go to Yellowstone, what's there that's famous? A geyser. Right, Old Faithful. And when it's getting ready to blow, everyone gathers around. And they're excited and they're waiting. Why? Because they know it's getting close and they can hear the gurgling. They feel the little rumbles and whatever else. And but then once it blows, like, okay, it's done. They take their pictures and they go on to something else. Go try to pet a bison and get kicked in the head. Because that's apparently what people do at Yellowstone. I don't know. I don't understand it. But it's about to blow. There's anticipation. There's excitement. Something is going to happen, and we need to be paying attention. We need to be ready, because if we're not ready, it's going to happen, and we're going to miss out. This very much goes along with what John wrote in his letters. This is the last hour. This is what Paul wrote in his letters. This is the last days. Okay, there's a sense of urgency, a sense of excitement, a sense of expectancy. And I think sometimes we lose that because we get so comfortable with the idea, he hadn't come yet, he's not coming today. I don't know. I don't know. And again, you've heard me use the illustration of cats and dogs, right? You can walk out of the room and come back and your dog's excited to see you because they've been waiting for you to get back. You could be gone for six months and come home and your cat doesn't even care you're alive. Right? They don't care if you're back. Just feed them, give them what they want, and then they're good to go, right? Now, sometimes we view God like cats. 
Okay, God, I have a need. I have an itch. You need to scratch it. Scratch it. Okay, we're done. Feed me now, and I'll leave you alone, and you can leave me alone. I think sometimes we get too comfortable here. This week, up in the Penn York District, this family camp, this, when I was up in Pennsylvania, this was one of my favorite weeks of the year up there. I loved going to family camp. My first year up there that I went, um, I put up a tent. It was a little two-person tent, because it was just me, and I put up that little two-person tent. It's what I had. It's all I needed. And that was great. Until that night, there was a rainstorm that blew through. And I could tell you, I really wanted to be anywhere else but in that tent under pine trees in a rainstorm. When I'm putting my hand up on the walls of the tent to keep it from blowing over. <laughs> I think some of us have gotten too comfortable being in tents here on this earth. And we're not looking to go back to our father's house. We've forgotten that, hey, there's something better waiting on us. There, there's something good that's coming. My grandfather always used to say, don't drive your tent stakes too deep, son. We're leaving in the morning. We're not supposed to get comfortable here. We're supposed to be looking ahead to what's coming. Now, he does give us a point of reference. The end is coming soon. Okay, We're between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet when he speaks. I'm not saying that's where we are now in the timeline of events. I'm just saying here when the angel speaks, he's speaking from the position between number six and number seven. He gives us a point of reference. The end is coming soon. He said, in these days, you got to be ready. It's not an exact time, but a landmark. Now, when I read this, again, maybe it's just because I'm not feeling good and I'm on a little bit of medicine right now, but my brain went, this guy must be southern. Turn left when you see the big tree. <laughs> I don't know how far down the road it is. I don't know how long it's going to take you to get there, but when you see the big tree, you better be ready to turn left, right? When you see the old parking lot where the Piggly Wiggly used to stand, you're going to make a right turn right there. Okay. Anybody got directions like that before? I have. And I got them in Pennsylvania. We moved to Pennsylvania. They're like, when you get up there to where the, uh, the, the, the weight loss center used to be, turn right. I'm like, well, where did the weight loss center used to be? It was up there on the corner. Well, I don't know which corner. I have no idea. I have no frame of reference. I don't know when the last Trump is coming. I have no frame of reference. I just know that it's coming. So I need to be aware that when it gets here, I need to be ready to take action, right? Because if I wait until it gets here, it's too late. If you wait to go to Walmart to buy a fire extinguisher until your house is on fire, it's going to be too late, right? That's just the way it goes. So, gives the point of reference. And then he says this, the mystery of God will be accomplished. The mystery of God will be accomplished. And I love this just like he said it would. That's pretty much what he says. We've already told you it's going to happen. And it's going to happen just the way God said it will happen. In fact, he said it thousands of years ago to different people over the course of thousands of years so that you got the picture and you understood this is going to happen. God's plans are perfect. They never fail. So what exactly does this mean? The mystery of God will be accomplished. Well, I think there's a couple things that we can pick up on this. One, time will no longer be a factor, right? Time is, is, is a construct that we have in place to measure the rotation of the sun and the earth through space. That's how we measure time, right? That's what it is. God is separate from time. He is eternal. Time has no factor on him. That's why it says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. Time is, is of no consequence. So when it says the mystery of God will be accomplished, there's no more time. We don't have to worry about being late or on time or... We just are. We are at eternity. We exist with the great I am, that eternal constant. Everything will be made perfect and new again. We're going to see at the end of the book, things are old heaven and the old earth are wiped away. There's a new heaven and a new earth. They're made new again. They're restored. There's no more death. There's no more sorrow. And we will see him face to face. And we're not going to have to wonder about stuff anymore because we will fully know as we're known. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be any questions like, what happens in Area 51? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? Right? These things that we think are so important now, all these big questions, I think they're just going to melt away when we get to glory and we see him face to face. We're not going to have to wonder. As Paul said in Corinthians, we're going to see clearly. It's like a veil will be lifted. And we're going to see things for the way they are. And we're going to know all that God has for us to know. The mystery the waiting, the anticipation, 
will finally be over. Restoration. I love that word. Restoration. Being made new. Fresh start. New purpose. A new lease on life. And for, for us, it's eternity. And that's why Jesus Christ came. He's in the restoration business. You know, he's a, he was a carpenter, right? That gets you the, the Greek and Hebrew, the term is a skilled laborer. We translate that as carpenter. But a master carpenter can not only build, but can also restore. And give purpose to things that are broken again. He can repurpose things that are too damaged from choices that have been made that they can't serve in their original capacity. Sometimes he can repurpose those things and make them beautiful again. This is what our God does. And so what does it mean the mystery of God will be accomplished? It means all these things are going to be wrapped up and be made complete. Now, this is an observation from the Wesley Bible Commentary. It becomes increasingly evident from John's visions that the end is always near, yet it is always being delayed by the judgments of God upon the earth because of man's sinfulness. It is not easy at this point to distinguish between the form of the truth and the truth itself, the drama and the revelation. While martyrs wait for the kingdom to come, which always seems to be delayed. At the same time, the visions tell us that God's kingdom has come, for John himself has seen it. It is also here now in the 144,000 who have the seal of God upon them, and it is at the same time in the perpetual progress of being fully realized. The same threefold concept of the kingdom is found in the teachings of Jesus. Now, that's a lot of big fancy words. I'm going to let you meditate on that later. What they're trying to say is the kingdom of God is always near. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. And yet God in his patience keeps pushing it back because he wants as many as possible to be saved. Now, I don't know that he's pushing it back. I think he knows exactly when it's going to come. But from our perspective, it really feels like we ought to be there by now, right? We put up with enough. Every generation has looked for the second coming for the end of human history, and rightfully so, because the kingdom is not just that which is to come, it's also that which is here. You and I, we are the kingdom. Why? Because not only are we made in the image of God, but we bear his seal upon our hearts. We are temples because the Holy Spirit, God himself, dwells within us. And it's also the kingdom that's in perpetual progress of being fully realized. There are other people who haven't realized it yet. We need to continue to preach the kingdom so that people are awakened from their death into life. And it's interesting that a triune God, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His kingdom would also really exist in three planes at once. <clears throat> the here and now, the future that's to come, and the things that we are working towards today our God is awesome now anyway I want you to read through this again when you get a little more time and think on it and remember too th this is a work of apocalyptic literature it relies heavily on symbolism which is one of their features okay it's how you know what kind of book it is and so a lot of what we're seeing John is writing with the understanding I'm not painting the full picture because there aren't human words available to paint the human picture, the full picture for human minds. So we're just kind of still behind that veil. I remember um, when I was a kid, we went to the Hagerstown Suns baseball game. Anybody ever see the Hagerstown Suns, Hagerstown Suns play? I think they used to play Richmond every once in a while. Anyway, they had a group for kids called the Knothole Gang. And the, the, that was a big deal for me to be a part of the knothole gang. And I remember the picture was of the kids, and they were peeking through the baseball game at the knotholes, right? Because they couldn't afford to buy tickets to get in. And so they would peek through the knotholes in the old wooden fence. It was a throwback to a bygone era. Okay, You and I, we're kind of in the knothole gang when it comes to Revelation. <laughs> we're just kind of peeping through the holes trying to see what is on the other side. And we, we get a little bit of a picture, and John's trying to explain to us Man, I was over there, and this is what I saw. 
But until you and I actually get there and see it for ourselves, we're, you know, we're peeping through the peepholes trying to figure it out. So a word of encouragement, if you don't understand everything, that's okay. I don't understand everything. I, I don't necessarily think the commentators understand everything. And they've literally published books on it. They would be considered as authorities on the subject. And yet, as I said before, if you read five commentaries, you'll get six opinions. We're still discussing this. Why? Because we don't have concrete answers. The Wesleyan Church as a whole does not take an eschatological stand that says, well, you have to believe it this way if you're going to be a Wesleyan. Why? Because there are different cases that can be made from Scripture for different events. And so instead we say, we just need to be faithful. We can discuss these things. We can look at these things. We can try our best to understand these things. And when God reveals things to us and he gives us understanding, wonderful. But we're not requiring this for our membership or for a means of salvation. Re revelation is not what saves you. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that's, that's the core. Revelation is just the good news that once you've understood the gospels and you've, you've received that forgiveness from God because you've confessed your sins and believed in the name of Jesus Christ as his son, I can face revelation I don't have to break a sweat because I've read the Gospels. So let's not get so tied up in this that we lose sight of what's really important. All right. Now we're going to jump into the second half of chapter 10. Now the second half of chapter 10 begins at verse 8. We're shifting gears a little bit here. we got the angel and he's massive and he's huge and he's speaking and he gives this message. For all of, all of creation, the time is coming, okay? The, the time will be delayed no more. And then we shift gears. And the focus shifts from a universal message for the whole world to a very personal message for John. And it switches from, I'm going to use these words loosely, Daniel-esque in the style of Daniel. Now we're going to switch to more of Ezekiel-esque. Okay? This is more in the style of Ezekiel. It's a little different. And for us, again, we read English. Okay, It just flows right through. But for them, the first century, as they were reading this, go, hey, that, that, that reads a little different. It's not that John's style has changed, but his point that he's referencing shifts. And if you're not up to snuff on your Old Testament, which you all should be, really need to get back into that because how many times has John referenced the Old Testament? I mean, every chapter is loaded with the Old Testament. I've heard some people say, we don't need the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament. It's passed away. You only need the New Testament. That's like saying you don't need tires, you just need a car. <laughs> that might be true. I don't need tires if I want to have a car, but if I want to get to where I need to go, I need to understand how to get there, so I put tires on the car. Okay. The Old Testament is the foundation for the New Testament. It is still the inspired word of God. So we need to hang in there. And I think we really need to dive deep into the Old Testament and understand the truth of it and how it points us to the New Testament. It points us to Jesus Christ. Because without that building block, none of this is really going to make sense. The voice from heaven speaks. Now this is the same voice that was in verse 4 that said, don't write that down when the thunder spoke. It speaks to him again. And this is a commanding voice. And I don't mean that in the sense that it's, hey, listen up. I mean that it gives him a command. It tells him what to do. It is a voice that has authority. Now, I personally, I look at this voice, I think this is the voice of God. To me, that just makes the most sense. John says, I hear a voice from heaven, and it's telling him what to do. Well, who's in heaven that gives commands? Okay, God. Now, John doesn't say it. The voice of God instead of voice from heaven. So we're not going to get hung up on that, but he tells him, go and take the scroll that lies open in the angel's hand. And, and I, I really like this. this. This made me chuckle today. Again, maybe it's the medicine. I don't know. Is John polite or scared? What is John's response? He says, go take the scroll in the hand of the angel. And what does John do? Does he go and take it? 
No, he asked for it. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Giant Angel Man. Can, can, I, can I have that little scroll right there, this, the one you're holding? He's not going to take it from this guy. I mean, this is a massive angel that spans the ocean and, and, and the land. God says, go take it. And just see you. Please? You guys got to remember, John is still human. Okay? We, we put him on a pedestal, but John is still human. What he's seeing is it's, it's changing the course of his entire life. When Daniel got his revelations, his prophecy, he said, I laid in bed sick for weeks because I was so disturbed. John is receiving this, but it's taking a toll on John as well. And so when he hears this, go and take the scroll. Take it? <laughs> Can I just ask and see if he gives it to me? Right. I, I, I think John is just being polite here. The angel gives it to him. He says, well, take it, but you need to know it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So like many things today, it comes with a warning label. Now, in Jeremiah 15, 16, we read, When your word came, I ate them. They were my joy, my heart's delight. For I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. Eating books, eating words is not a new idea. It's not a new concept. It's not like someone said, Ew, he's going to eat that? I get that a lot at home from my kids. You're going to eat that? First century Jewish and Christian reader who was reading this would not go, well, that's really weird. He's going to eat the scroll. This idea of consuming the word of God as our nourishment goes all the way back thousands of years at this point to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 8.3b, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, I know Deuteronomy is not necessarily the most exciting book in the Bible. It does have a very fun name, though. It's also fun to try and spell when you're tired. But... Deuteronomy is the book that Jesus quotes three times when he's tempted by Satan. So if Jesus uses Deuteronomy, I think it's important for us to learn. Again, go back and study the Old Testament in detail. That's what Jesus had when he was preaching. He was preaching from the Old Testament. Contrary to popular belief, Paul and Silas did not have the 1611 version of the King James Version Bible. They were writing it at the time. Okay? Jesus preached from the Old Testament. Jesus defended himself with the Old Testament. Jesus stood on the rock of truth that is the Old Testament. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? It sustains us. It nourishes us. It keeps us alive. So he gets this warning. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. Now, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, Ezekiel is commissioned to be a prophet he is commanded to eat a scroll, and he is told, in this, in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey. In fact, in my Bible, the words, in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey, are in quotation marks. This is the direct quote from Ezekiel. For Ezekiel, he was serving while the people were in exile. And he was able to really get them reacquainted with God. Now, these people were having an identity crisis. They were taught. They grew up. All they knew was worship in the temple. And now the temple has been destroyed. The people are marched off into exile. Well, as far as they knew, God only lives in the temple. How do we worship him from Babylon? And people gave up. And so Ezekiel was called to build this restorative relationship between God and his people again. And so the message was sweet. Ezekiel, I want you to tell the people about me. I want you to bring this generation home. Wow. That's, that's sweet. And he enjoyed, for the most part, being Israel's prophet and turning people back to God. But here, John's comes with the warning, probably made by Pfizer. Turns his stomach sour. Anybody ever have a sour stomach? Okay? It is not fun. You just don't feel good. And sour stomach is not always brought on by what you eat. Sometimes it's brought on by what you have to do. 
what you have to say. And yes, it's sweet to serve the Lord and sweet to bear his message. Sometimes the conversations you have to have are not fun. Sometimes you have to deliver troubling news. Sometimes you have to pronounce judgment. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. And if you keep down this path, it's going to lead to your destruction. That's not a fun conversation to have, right? Especially in this inclusive day and age where everything goes. It's okay. You can do. God understands. God loves you. He just wants you to be happy. God wants you to have everything you ever had. Our whole vacation Bible school, the core premise was the world says this, but God says this. That was at the core of everything we taught. The world says this, but God's truth, it says this. This is what we need to believe. Now, for John, what he has seen has not been fun. This has not been pleasant. He's not going to have to say, hey, a third of you are going to die. That's not a fun message. You guys are going to have to face unfathomable persecution. Your family is going to be rounded up and fed to lions and murdered in the streets. And you're just going to have to trust God. This is not a great message that he has to bring, but it's an important message. He says, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now, he's given a universal message, just like the angel. The angel is a messenger. He says, I'm bringing a universal message. And then John takes the scroll from his hand, and he's given a universal calling. Our message, the gospel message, is not meant to be hoarded. It's meant to be shared. It's not meant to be gobbled up, tucked away. meant to be given you know we've been fighting a lot of wars against terrorism I heard a statistic the other day and to be fair I haven't background checked this so I'm going to use a liberal number here like 3% of all of the wealth I mean 100 or, sorry 80% of all the wealth in these Middle Eastern countries is, is held up by less than 3% of the population but the bad guys are those evil American Western dogs. And people eat it up. Why? Because they're blinded to the truth because that's all they're fed is lies. You look at Afghanistan in the 1970s before the Taliban took over, you could have been standing in Miami. And now they have running water when it rains. Why? Because if I keep people down, I keep them ignorant, I keep control. That's what Satan does. Our message is not to be hoarded among a small number of people. The monastic movement in the church, probably one of the worst things the church ever did. Let's take all the good Christian people who are really serious about their faith and let's cloister them away so they have no impact on society around them at large. Boy, that's not a recipe for disaster. Let's not allow people to learn how to read because if they can read, they might figure out that we're not teaching them what the Bible actually says, right? Hence the reason Martin Luther sat down and wrote out 95 different problems with the church. He said, guys, these are 95 things that are scripturally wrong that we need to get back to the Bible on. Well, they didn't get there overnight. How do they get there? We're going to put all the Christians over here. We're going to tell them how to think and what they have to do. If they really want to be good Christians, they have to leave society and give up everything and the rest of the world, well, quite frankly, it can just go to hell. Why do we have a problem with terrorists in the Middle East? Well, because for 1,500 years, we did nothing. We just left them to their own devices. Well, they have Allah. They're fine. Why? Well, because we had monasteries. You know, one time, northern Africa was the seat of Christian influence in the world. Now people in Africa, northern Africa, are being crucified again. Why? Well, because we let the Muslims have it. Why? Because it was too much of a trouble. If you want to look at the earliest Christian churches, where were they? They were in 
the Middle East and they were in Northern Africa. And yet, why? Well, we, we kept the message to ourselves. If they want to die and go to hell, that's on them. We're okay. We're just going to keep doing the right thing because we're going to go to heaven. And that's what's important. We, we lost our focus. There is an urgency here to obey and to preach the word. All right, what, what's our verse of the year? Don't deceive yourselves. Okay? By only listening to the word. Do what it says. Do what it says. Well, what's it say? Don't tell anybody about Jesus. No, literally the last command he gave us was go and make disciples. How do you make disciples? You teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. That's what he said. Teach them. The end is near, and it's only delayed by God's grace. And it's not always a sweet message, but it's no less important. So, in review... God's timing is perfect, even if we don't understand it, especially when we don't understand it. God's message is universal because he is the God of the universe. God's messages are not always fun, but they are important. And we're going to meet again on July 17th. Uh, we will not meet next week because of district conference. Uh, I love you all, but I can't go to district conference and prepare for this so we'll meet again in two weeks uh, and uh, I love you guys you know you are more than welcome to come and meet and have a prayer meeting in here if you want a lot of people got keys I don't, I don't even know who all has keys so y'all welcome to come in here and, and turn the AC on have a prayer meeting if you want next Wednesday we'll pick up Revelation on the 17th now in August we will be jumping back into impact classes again uh, I know Bob's going to be teaching a class on prayer. Uh, I believe we're going to have the women's. September. Sorry, in September. September. Thank you, September, not in August. Um, I blame the medicine. I blame the medicine. Uh, in September, we're going to be jumping back into impact classes again. So y'all be praying for impact. Last year, I was blown away by your faithfulness and the attendance of impact classes. So keep up the good work, church, and uh, let me pray us out of here. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this day and for the time we have to spend together in studying your word. I ask, Lord, that we will take these things and we will think on them. We will let them marinate in our minds and in our hearts, Lord, and that we will apply them. We will not wait, but Lord, we will pick up the sense of urgency that you have called us to go and share your word. Father, help us not to rest comfortably on our laurels, but to be about our Father's business. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. God bless. Go be the church.